No, the human memory. Such an unreliable thing, and yet such a comfort to all of us. We sure remember those distant memories, don't we? We can remember exactly what happened all those years ago in that place, and at that time. But can we really? How reliable are our memories, and how much can we trust them? And so is the theme of tonight's intriguing story, another one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, shared with me so that I could read it for all of you. Well, my dear friends, we've made it to Friday. The weekend is upon us, and I think you deserve to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Now, before I begin my story, let me assure you I'm not crazy, and that every word of this is true. <laughs> I guess that sounds cliche. I really don't know. Honestly, I don't visit forums like this, and rarely read past the sports page. My wife had gone on vacation for a couple of weeks, leaving me by myself as we don't have kids, and, well, I couldn't get time off work. Feeling bored and a little lonely, I decided to go out and see a late movie on my third night alone. I was actually a little excited. I hadn't gone to the movies in years. I got to the theatre around midnight. Like the parking lot, the lobby was eerily empty. Only one employee manning the concession stand. An especially scrawny and pimply teenager wearing an appropriately dorky burgundy uniform. I bought a soda and a popcorn, grumbled under my breath about the price, and made my way to the screen. I was the only person sitting in the dimly lit theatre. I was completely alone except, I guess, for the projectionist. The enormous screen was completely black, and stayed that way when the lights started to dim. Now, I don't remember what movie I'd bought a ticket to see, but when the screen lit up, I knew immediately that something was wrong. There were no credits, no ads or trailers, nothing even recognizable to the human eye. There was just shaky camera movement and reddish, pinkish, Blurry textures waving across the screen. Then choked, convulsive sobs flooded through the theatre walls, and the image on screen came into focus. It was a woman, crouched on all four, staring pleadingly into the camera. Her long blonde hair matted with blood over one eye. My skin crawled. I felt extremely uncomfortable watching this strange woman sob piteously on screen. And again, there were no credits. Nothing to indicate this was part of the movie or a trailer for something. Her cries then took on a wet, guttural quality. And I could make out a brown shag carpet on the floor. On it, right next to where her hands were placed, was a wide, visibly wet red stain. I jumped in my seat when I finally heard a voice. Please. It was the woman on screen, facing directly into the camera. Andrew, don't. She wailed, her cracked voice filling the theatre. I then realised she wasn't looking into the camera, but was addressing whomever was holding it. Please, she begged again, her teeth bared, her tears turning the blood speckles on her cheek bright pink. Andrew, don't... But her voice was cut off by an arm, extending from behind the camera, striking her in the head. But it wasn't a slap or a punch. There was something held in the arm's hand, a weapon of some kind. It was too fast the first time for me to catch, when I saw it the second, and the third, and the fourth. A ball-peen hammer, wielded by the presumed cameraman, caving in her skull until there was nothing 
left. The woman lay face down, her brains and matter everywhere, the camera panning over her supine body. Nothing emanated from the sound system except the hum of the camcorder overheating. I felt sick. I wanted to throw up. I don't know exactly how, but I knew what I had seen was real. That was no CGI or special effect. Someone had actually died, and I'd been shown their last grisly moments. Repulsed by what I'd just witnessed, I stormed out of the theatre and went to confront the manager. The awkward dweeb at the concession stand was the only person available, and when we both went to inspect the projection room, we were horrified to find no one there that the projector was streaming white light and nothing else. After hearing my story, he took the projector apart and examined the reel. <sighs> there was nothing. Nothing but clear, blank panels. I assured him of what I'd seen, and he told me that we should call the police. The police came, examined the theatre, finding nothing, and took both of our statements, and then left. I couldn't sleep for three nights after what I'd seen, but after the fourth night, I'd managed to successfully block the images out of my mind. I figured the episode was over, and tried to move on with my life. <laughs> that was until day five. At the construction site where I work, two men dressed in rumpled suits came asking for me around the time my shift was ending. They told me they were cops and wanted to know if I'd be willing to come to the station and answer some follow-up questions about what I'd seen at the movies that night. Reluctantly, half wanting to cooperate and half wanting to forget the whole thing, well, I agreed. They brought me into a cramped, rectangular room with a long, cheaply built table and three fold-out chairs. The one cop left to get me a coffee, and when he came back he said, How's it feeling being back here? With a wide, hungry grin on his face. I frowned. What was he talking about? I asked him, and the second cop responded by asking, in all seriousness, if I remembered what had happened that night. I, of course, relayed everything to them, stopping at when the two cops took my statement, since nothing significant had happened after that. While I was doing this, the two cops listened intently. When I finished, they both looked at each other. It was like they were sharing a joke I wasn't in on. The second cop spoke first. That's not exactly what happened, Mr. Greer, he said in a cold, emotionless voice. The kid at the concession stand was the one who called 911, and it was because he said there was a belligerent man refusing to leave and demanding to be let into the projection room. When officers Cole and Sharma arrived, they assumed you were high on drugs and took you in so you could sleep it off. You were released the very next day. Again, I frowned. <laughs> that wasn't how I remembered it. The officer continued. Despite their theory you were intoxicated, officers Cole and Sharman investigated your claim about the obscene film. There were no records of any such film, or any obscene videos in the area. Then they decided to pass on your description of the woman whom you claim you saw beaten to death, to Homicide Division and missing persons. As someone who works in Homicide, Mr. Greer, I can tell you there is nobody matching your description. Then, the first cop broke in with, and there was no missing person matching your description either, until 2.33 this morning. The cop then slid a thumbnail photograph across the table toward me. My heart leapt in my chest. It was her, the poor woman in the film. 
I then heard the cold voice of the second cop say, Mr. Greer, is that your wife? Stunned, I rocked back in my chair. Of course she wasn't. I mean, I suppose they look somewhat alike, but the woman in the video definitely wasn't the person I was married to. The same cop then asked, Where is your wife, Mr. Greer? I told them. She was on vacation. Had been for eight days. I'd spoken to her that morning, for Christ's sake. Both furious and panicked, I fished out my phone from my pocket and showed them. But when I navigated to my call history, a shudder went down my spine. It was empty. No record of any texts or calls in the last 24 hours. The two detectives stared at me with cruel, hooded eyes. They both then explained that someone had filed a missing persons report for my wife after she'd failed to show up to a class for eight days and hadn't answered her phone in five. The cops wouldn't tell me, but I'm assuming it was someone from my wife's yoga class since she went there every night after work. They also told me that she'd contacted the insurance firm where my wife works and that her boss had told them that she'd been MIA for eight days without calling in sick or having scheduled time off beforehand. I couldn't believe it when they told me that. <laughs> my wife was on vacation. She would never just up and leave without getting time off work first. Something else that I find interesting, the second cop said grimly. You were very specific about the weapon that was used to kill your, excuse me, to kill the woman in the film. A ball-peen hammer. <laughs> Most people would have just said a hammer. Bitingly, I asked him what the fuck that had to do with anything. He then calmly asked what kind of jobs I'd had. I told him that I worked construction, and had been a welder before that. And then I got what he was getting at. You seem to know a lot about tools, Mr. Greer, he said, a horrible smirk cracking his bloodless face. Would a tool like that be found in your house? Perhaps your garage? I didn't answer. I just sat there, feeling them out like they were feeling me out. Then the first cop spoke up. Oh, just one more question, Andrew. You said that your wife, Mrs. Greer, is on vacation. Where is she on vacation? I then told him she'd gone to Bermuda. Well, that's what I remember her telling me, anyway. He asked for her flight details, but I didn't have those memorized. I could only tell him her departure and arrival dates. Are you sure that information is correct? He asked. Because if we find out that it's not, you could be in a lot of... The second cop then loudly interrupted, speaking over him about how we're all trying to work together and blah, blah, blah. But I knew what the first cop had almost told me. They were going to check if my wife had actually made her flight, and if she hadn't, they were going to get a search warrant. Obviously, the second cop didn't want to tip their hand, so I wouldn't go home and destroy the evidence. Well, I wasn't under arrest, so they let me go and told me to call them if anything else happened. It's been six hours since then, and I've been frantically trying to type this out, as there's a good possibility that pretty soon I won't have access to the internet for a long, long time. Simultaneously, I've also been calling and texting my wife incessantly, but all I get is a voicemail and no messages back. If you're wondering, I did check the house, and no, I didn't find any blood-soaked carpet or camcorder or ball-peen hammer, but I did find a set of keys that I didn't recognize. After googling the logo on the plastic handle, I found out they belonged to a storage unit facility on the outskirts of the city. I just... I just don't know what the hell to think. I keep waiting for my door to be kicked in 
and an armoured SWAT team to come swarming in to tear my house apart. I really just don't know what to think. Am I being framed? Is this something paranormal? Or am I trapped in something like those Matrix movies or whatever? Or am I actually losing my mind? I mean, if I really am crazy, what is this? What's wrong with me? Of course, I'm also worried sick about my wife, but I swear to God, that woman in the film wasn't her. I know she's not dead, though I don't know. The more I think about that film, the more they start to look alike. I know a lot of you are probably going to think that I actually killed my wife and I'm just lying, but if that was so, then why would I write this and post it online? Please, 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 if you have any idea of what's happening, just tell me. I don't care if I end up in jail, just so long as I know what is actually going on. Well, 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 that was an intriguing one, wasn't it? What do you make of that? Is he going insane? Or is someone playing a trick on him? Or is something much, much worse going on? As ever, my dear friends, I'd love you to leave a comment below the video, and I will do my best to reply to as many as I can. It's Friday, and you know what? You deserve to go and have some fun, so off you go. Go on. <laughs> And if you're out there on the night shift, or if you're driving long haul, then I hope you enjoyed this one. Only a short one for you this evening, but I'm always here for you guys, okay? Stories will keep going as long as I keep wanting to do this. So, go on. Have a nice weekend. Back again with a much longer story for you on Monday. But for now, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>